Chapter 20 Now, if you have any problems with that saw or the arrows, you come right back here, Robbie said, as Link placed the wrapped bundle of arrows in the saddlebags. They were much too large and unwieldy to place in his quiver with the other arrows, next to the fresh salted meat and vegetables that he had purchased in town. They are sensitive, fragile things, made of many moving parts and components, not like a piece of iron. Link would rather not think of his weapons as fragile. They needed to be sturdy and capable of both attack and defense. But Robbie assured him that the sword, at least, would be far more resilient to punishment than the guardian sword had been. He wore the champion's tunic on the day of his departure, Impa's words of providing hope to those who recognized it ringing out in his head. Robbie certainly knew it. He once saw Link dressed in this tunic over one hundred years ago, on this very hill. It was a sobering thought, yet it almost made him stand just a little taller. Thank you for your help, Link said, as he finished strapping down his equipment. If I see Pura or Impa before your message arrives, I'll make sure to pass it on. It was time that the three Sheikah elders met once more, Robbie had told him. Their self-imposed exile served its purpose. They each managed to survive the last century, each having passed on what he or she knew to Link after he woke. Now it was time to look to the future. Robbie recommended they both make a journey to his home before the end of spring, so that they could begin the next phase of their plan, whatever that may be. He was comforted to know that he wouldn't be the only one acting. Still, it was time to get on with his own mission. Death Mountain loomed far over the mountains to the west, and the smoke rising from its open maw seemed thicker and blacker now than before. It was a cause for concern, especially considering Robbie told him that the volcano had last been this active in the year leading up to the Calamity Ganon's return. Link hoped that this detour to better prepare himself would not result in disaster for others. He and the Sheikah pair said their goodbyes, with Link promising to keep Jaren informed of any new shrines that he encountered. She had hoped that he would travel with her to another shrine three days out of his way, but he refused as politely as he could. It had already been too long since he freed Ruta, as it was. With one final wave, he spurred spirit into motion, riding out of the small ramshackle village of New Kasudo. After he left the town, he took the southern road instead of riding back the way he came, and towards the quarry. The memory still fresh in his mind, he wished to avoid being anywhere near that place for the time being. Perhaps he would try to revisit it another time, to see what other memories might surface. But for now, he wanted to keep moving. As he continued down the gentle incline, he rode past farmland, where residents of New Kasudu worked the fields. Several of them looked up at him as he passed, but none stopped him or called out. The people here, like in many other places in Hyrule, were unaccustomed to seeing strangers. Merchants like Telma seemed to be the only tenuous links that existed between the scattered residents of Hyrule. Thinking on the boisterous red-haired woman made Link feel anxious for her safety. She was the first person that he'd really met after waking. He had seen no sign of her on the road since they parted ways at the Dueling Peaks stable. She had headed in the direction of Zora's domain, but in all the excitement of the Divine Beast, he hadn't even thought to ask them if she had made it safely. The eastern road that led north alongside Hyrule Field did not seem as infested with monsters as he had initially feared, but the stable that he had met Cass had certainly indicated that it wasn't always as safe as he had found it. As he rounded a bend in the road surrounded on either side by rock walls, the scenery opened up to reveal an open field miles wide, without a tree in sight. To the east, the ocean stretched on to the horizon, and Link could see the strange spiral-shaped patch of land that he'd noticed before. A herd of wild horses grazed in the field not so far from the road. He could tell from Spirit's gate that the horse wanted to pick up the pace, to run into the open field, and Link couldn't blame him. He gave the horse his head and leaned low as they broke into a gallop, leaving the road behind and running out into the field. The wind blew his hood back and caused his hair to stream behind him. A flock of cranes took flight, startled by the galloping horse. 
As they raced across the land, joy bubbled up from Link's stomach, and soon he was grinning and laughing. Thoughts of duty and past failures fled, and he enjoyed simply being in the moment, feeling the wind and the sun on his face, and smelling the sea air. He whooped loudly, which only seemed to spur Spirit on faster. Their gallop lasted for a surprisingly long time. Previously, when Link had pushed him, the horse had shown good endurance, but no horse could run at full speed for more than a few miles at a time. This time, however, Spirit maintained his gallop across the entire field, seeming to relish in the salty sea air and the feel of grass under his hooves. What should have taken them several hours to cross ended up taking less than an hour. Perhaps the field was smaller than it initially appeared. When finally Spirit slowed to a walk, his strides heaving with deep breaths, the ground had begun to steadily rise again. He climbed off of the horse's back, patting his neck with pride. Spirit had certainly earned his rest. Surprisingly, after nearly an hour of galloping, Link didn't feel sore either. If anything, he actually felt looser and more rested than he'd felt in days. They had apparently both needed to burn off some tension. After giving Spirit a carriage from his pack, he walked over to a small rise, taking his seat in the grass. He pulled out some of the fruits and vegetables that he'd received from the village to eat. Did we see this when we came here before? He wondered aloud. Spirit snorted and bent his head low to eat a patch of grass, having finished his carrot. Not you. I mean me and Princess Zelda. Princess Zelda and I. He stared out at the ocean. Zelda and I. Something about saying her name made him feel a rush of... What? Warmth? More than that. It made him feel nervous, too. An excited sort of anxiety. Link sighed and fell back, so that he was looking up at the blue skies. Goddess. It's like with me fall all over again. What did I feel for her? She was a princess. A princess that I traveled with alone. A princess that I called by name. A princess that sat beside me for warmth and comfort. A princess that I was sworn to protect. He didn't like the uncomfortable feeling that settled into the pit of his stomach at these thoughts and closed his eyes. Link's eyes opened at a particularly sharp tug of his hair, revealing a bright, though noticeably cloudier sky overhead, and the long face of spirit directly over him. The horse had a lock of Link's hair in his mouth, along with a tuft of grass. When he met the horse's eyes, Spirit snorted a blast of hot breath into his face. Groaning, he pulled his hair free, rubbing his scalp, and pushed Spirit's face away from his. He sat up and looked around the open field. He must have fallen asleep, lulled by the warmth of the day and the distant sound of the waves. He hadn't slept long, judging by the height of the sun, an hour or two at most. He noticed that the grass around him was much patchier than it had been when they arrived and gave Spirit a sidelong look, single eyebrow raised. The horse, for his part, simply pulled up another tuft of grass, ignoring him. You're a glutton, Link said, pushing himself to his feet. Worse than me. Brushing the grass off of himself, he sighed and looked around at the field around him. He could see the herd of horses that he'd seen earlier. They seemed curious about him, but also wary, staying close enough to watch him, but far enough to be able to bolt if needed. After stretching, he rolled his neck and looked back at his horse, clicking his tongue. Spirit did not respond. Frowning, he clicked his tongue again. Again, the horse ignored him, quite happy to graze. Link walked over to Spirit, taking the reins and pulling the horse's head up to look at him. We've been working on this. He patted Spirit's neck before releasing the reins and making a circle around the horse to ensure he still looked healthy and whole. He really should have inspected his horse after their long gallop. Finally satisfied, he mounted Spirit with a grunt, taking the reins in his hands. He clicked his tongue once more, only for the horse to ignore him for a third time. You're the one that wanted to run so much. I didn't make you do that. Now come on. He nudged Spirit with his feet, and finally the horse stopped grazing and began to plod back towards the road. 
Madea's travel continued uneventfully after that. He observed their location with his map, choosing to avoid the path that would take them down into the wetlands. That road would take them right alongside the citadel and its guardian. So when they came to the fork in the road, he opted to turn left and continue south, their elevation steadily climbing. According to the Sheikah Slate's map, this area of the Akala Highlands was not largely inhabited 100 years ago. There looked to have once been a small settlement further to the south, but it was still a ways off. So that was why, as the sun began to set over the mountains to the west, he was surprised to find a place lit by torches and lamps, and what appeared to be a familiar-looking house in the process of being built. The strange sight was a little off the road, on a large island spire in the middle of the lake that made up half of the torn wetlands. The island was accessible by a natural land bridge that connected it to the side of the lake. The vegetation on the bridge had been cleared away, and he could see car tracks leading from the road to the bridge. The island had likewise been cleared of vegetation, and a multi-story house had been framed. Several tents stood off to one side, near stacks of construction materials, along with several wagons and a number of horses and mules. The other side of the island, however, held a number of large boulders and stone outcroppings that he imagined would prove very difficult to build around. He eased spirit to a stop as he reached the bridge, frowning as he looked across to the strange construction that seemed so out of place in this otherwise deserted location. As he watched, several men walked into view, each wearing a colored vest. At their head stood a man that he recognized, tall and broad-shouldered, with a mop of black hair and an equally thick mustache. Hudson of Bolson Construction, from Hateno Village. What in Hylia's name? He guided his horse across the bridge. At the entrance to the construction site, a pair of posts had been driven into the ground on either side of the bridge, with a sign hanging between them. The sign had no words on it, however, and it just served as an arch to pass under. As he approached, the group of men that had apparently just sat down around a fire to eat their evening meal stood, looking wary. None of them were armed, while Link was, perhaps, too armed. Hudson walked forward, looking up at him with a frown. Finally, he said, Mr. Link? Hudson, right? Link said, as he dismounted. What are you doing here? Building. Link looked at the tall man, amused by his short way of speaking. It could be difficult to get a sense of what he was thinking behind the thick mustache and beady eyes. Well, yes, I can... When did you get here? I just saw you in Hatsuno Village. And Link had the advantage of instantaneous transportation through the Sheikah Slate. About two days ago. That would mean that they had just been a day behind Link on the road. They had probably left right after he bought the house in town. I think we should have that house finished in another two days. But no one lives out here, Link said, still confused. We do. So you quit working with Bolson and decided to move out here? Hudson looked surprised at this, looking back to the other men that were observing their conversation. He looked back at Link. No. At Link's silence, he continued. Bolson asked us to come here. Build it and they will come. That's what the boss said, said one of the other men. Link thought that he might recognize him from his evening stay in the inn when he first arrived at Hatano but he wasn't sure. You're just building out here in hopes that people will move here? Yes, Hudson replied. And no. He paused, seeming to consider for a time. Apparently deciding that more words were needed, he continued. Bolson heard that some people were hoping to move out here. Some people from Otno and Laurelin. He sent you out here to build houses for them. That's not a house. Hudson looked back at the building being constructed, and Link noticed his posture change slightly. He stood up a little straighter, prouder. That is the new headquarters for the North Bolson Construction Company. The other construction workers all beamed at his mention of the name. Link was not a businessman. He was fairly certain that he hadn't been one in the past, either. Still, this all seemed to be a very high-risk operation to him. Then again, he had met Bolson. The man could be eccentric. But why set up here? Why not New Casuto? Bolson liked the location. Well, Link supposed that was as good a reason as any other. 
and he had to admit, though, that this was probably a better place for a construction company to set up shop. New Kasudo had a few small groves of trees, but it was largely fields and farmland. This side of the Akala Highlands, however, was much more densely forested. Still, he wasn't sure about the viability of this business expansion of Bolson's. There was an awkward pause as they both looked at each other, each waiting for the other to continue the conversation. Finally, Hudson finally motioned towards the cook fire that he and his men had set up for their evening meal. Link smiled and nodded, equally less silent. As they ate together, Hudson and his crew explained in more detail what exactly they were doing here. It would seem that a wealthy man and vineyard owner from Hatsuno Village had spoken to Bolson of his desire to move out to the Akala Highlands in order to recover some land that had once belonged to his ancestors before the Calamity. The man had agreed to finance an expedition into the Akala Highlands, including the construction of several homes for him and any employees that he brought with him. Bolson, seeing an opportunity, decided to expand on the original investment. Rather than merely build a vineyard, he imagined something far grander. A new settlement. The first new Hylian town established in nearly 100 years. An entire town built by the newly established North Bolson Construction Company, with Hudson at its head. There was, of course, one little snag. We need a Goron, Hudson said, as he ate some of the stew that they had. A Goron? Link asked, looking up from his bowl, spoon in one hand. A Goron! Hudson lifted the bowl to his lips, tilting it back and finishing off the remains. Some of the stew dripped from his mustache when he lowered the bowl. Those rocks are a lot worse than we were expecting. When Bolson told us there would be some rocks that we had to clear, we were thinking some, well, rocks, said another of the Bolson construction employees named Nelson. Not huge boulders the size of houses. We just didn't have the manpower to clear them, Hudson continued, nodding towards Nelson. They would take months even with everyone back at Hantano Village, and we don't have the necessary tools or materials. With just us, it could set Terry Town back for, he looked around at the other construction workers, years, maybe longer. But a Goron could help. Well, yeah, Nelson said, excitably. They're the experts when it comes to rock breaking, right? Hudson sucked his mustache and nodded. A Goron or two could do it easily. I was thinking about sending some of the sons up to the mountain and see if they could find any willing to work with us. The sons? Link asked, frowning. The crew shared silent looks among themselves. Finally, Hudson cleared his throat. <clears throat> you didn't notice? At his confused expression, a few of the other men started chuckling. It's one of the most important policies that we follow at the Bolson Construction Company. All employees must have a name that ends with son. Well, Link supposed that in the face of the continued downward spiral of civilization, there would always be some oddities that might crop up. The stress could make anyone crack. So if I wanted to join your team, you could. Because my name isn't Linkson. I suppose you could choose to change your name, but... Hudson considered for a moment, but then he shook his head. No, I don't think the boss would like that. So no. We appreciate the offer, though. I wasn't offering, Link thought with a small smile. But out loud, he said... I'm actually going to be heading up to Death Mountain. I'm on my way there now. I can ask if any Gorons would be interested in coming down to help. Hudson rubbed at his mustache and thought, squinting at Link over the fire. Link, for his part, wasn't quite sure why he was under such scrutiny. Finally, the tall man nodded. I can't offer you any pay since you aren't an employee, but we would be very grateful if you were able to find any Gorons to assist us. I'm not asking for any, as long as their names adhere to the standard Bolson Construction Company naming guidelines. Maybe this wasn't a good idea. Right, well, if I come across any Grons who are interested in helping, and have names that end in Sun, then I'll make sure to send them your way. Great, Hudson said, clearly pleased by this turn of events. The corners of his mustache, which covered most of his mouth, rose in a smile. In that case, he rose from his seat walked over to a nearby barrel. He grabbed a couple of mugs off of its lid. As soon as he did so, the other men around the fire quickly jumped up, hurrying over to him. After a few moments of busy commotion, Hudson walked back to the fire, holding two large mugs full of amber liquid, while the others busily filled their own mugs at the cask. 
got to ration this stuff, since it's all we got. But since we're entering into a mutually beneficial business arrangement, it seemed like the right time. Hudson held the mug out to Link, who took it warily. He wasn't actually sure how this business arrangement was in any way mutually beneficial. Hudson smiled broadly and lifted his mug to his lips. After a moment of hesitation, Link did the same. The ale burned on its way down, forcing him to suppress the urge to cough, before settling in his stomach with a pleasantly warm sensation. It had a distinct honey flavor that was very pleasant indeed. He took another drink. So, I don't have any idea how in the goddess name I'm supposed to kill a giant pig demon, Link said, gesticulating with his hands. The other men had gone off to bed, leaving Hudson and Link the sole individuals left by the dwindling fire. But I've got to. For her. Well, you have to find a way to save her, Hudson said, nodding sagely. Exactly. I mean, I can't leave her trapped in there with it, right? I am, or was, I don't know, her knight. And maybe her friend. I think we were friends. I don't know. I wish I could remember more of the damn past. I don't remember a lot of my childhood. Hudson lifted his mead to his lips, finishing off his mug. Apparently, I fell off of a tree and hit my head. Mama said I barely made it. I hate not remembering anything. It feels like I'm missing a part of myself. I can't help but to think that if I remembered everything, this wouldn't be so bad. I would know just how to defeat it. Link paused, frowning. Right? I had to know how to defeat it back then. I couldn't have been walking in completely blind. I'm sure you'll figure it out. You killed the thing in Zora's domain. Yeah, by sheer happenstance. If Miva hadn't been there, I'd be as dead as... He trailed off, grimacing. I don't know. He paused, looking down at his empty mug. How many drinks had he had? He couldn't remember. You know... I keep thinking that I heard Zelda talk to me while I was in Zora's domain, after freeing the Divine Beast. I could almost swear that I heard her while I was sleeping, but she hasn't answered me since. Maybe you were just dreaming. It didn't feel like a dream, though. I've had dreams about her, too, and it wasn't the same. He groaned and set the mug down, leaning forward and placing his head on his hands. I could have sworn she was right there. Right next to me. Hudson blew a long breath out through his mustache. Sometimes I dream I have a woman next to me while I sleep. That's not... I mean, I don't think that's what I... Link hesitated, shaking his head. His vision briefly grew blurry before sharpening again. Regardless, it's just... I have so many questions that no one seems to want to answer. Or that he was afraid to ask if he was being honest with himself. Their conversation continued for several more minutes before finally Hudson rose, groaning slightly. He walked over and placed a large hand on Link's shoulder, patting it. I'm sure you'll figure it out. With that, he turned and walked off to lie down in his tent, not even bothering to remove his boots or vest. Link sat there for a time, staring into the fire. Finally, he stood unsteadily. He blinked, amusedly, as the world wobbled and spun around him. How much had he drunk? When equilibrium steadied, he carefully made his way away from the fire, a hand to his forehead. He approached his bedroll, which had been placed on a patch of grass opposite the construction worker's sleeping area. As he removed his tunic and trousers, he couldn't help himself but to look up at the sky overhead. The lamps had been doused, and the crescent moon overhead only provided so much illumination. He thought that he could see millions of stars overhead stretching on for as far as the eye could see. It was beautiful. He looked around and saw the shadow of the Akala Citadel, silhouetted by the orange glow of Death Mountain. He was close enough to it again that it rose high in his vision. A spire of death and destruction. A place where guardians still lived, still flew, still searched for him. It sent a chill down his spine, making him wish... He was still sitting beside the fire. He lay down, snuggling into his bedroll and trying to get comfortable. It was difficult, 
as he found that the patch of grass upon which he'd set up his things hid several small rocks that all seemed to find their way to various points on his back, shoulders, and buttocks. He sighed and set about trying to clear the rocks away. Fire. Everything was burning. Everyone was dying. He stood alone in an open circle, surrounded by buildings of flame. Distantly, he heard screaming, people in pain. His people. He whirled around looking for someone, anyone, that he could save. But he saw nothing but a city in flame. Where are you? He called, eyes wide with panic. Where was his family? Where were his friends? Where was his princess? Answer me! Where are you? More screams. More terror. He broke into a run towards an alley, but the fire spread to engulf it before he could reach it. For a moment, he thought he saw a face. A girl several years younger than he, with blue eyes. But then she was gone, consumed by the blaze. He turned, sprinting the other way. Another alley, another way out. But it too burst into flames as he approached. He heard the sounds of metal clanging against metal, men screaming as they died. Where are you? Link! A voice. His princess. Zelda. He turned eyes wide looking for her. She had just been with him, hadn't she? When had he lost sight of her? He sprinted around the large circle. In the center of it was a broken fountain that had dried up. Princess! He heard a scream. A terrible, awful scream. It made his blood run cold. Zelda! Something crashed behind him, and he whirled, eyes widening in horror. Six legs, each long and flexible, climbed over the rubble and bodies of its fallen brethren. It stood over him, and he was too weak to run anymore. He barely stood, leaning against his sword. He could no longer fight, but he would face death on his feet. The blue eye found him and flashed red with recognition. It began to charge its beam, and he screamed in furious denial. The eye fired. He burned. He bolted upright in his bedroll, chest heaving, eyes wide with panic. For a moment, everything still burned around him. He could see that terrible blue eye looking down at him, with the intent on ending his life. But then it was gone, and he was still on the island that had been named Terrytown. He placed a hand to his chest, feeling the way his heart raced. When he pulled his hand away, it came away wet. He was drenched in sweat. His hair, free of its ponytail, stuck to the sides of his face. His bedroll was soaked. Shakily, he stood. The weakness that he had felt made him think of how he'd been in the dream, barely able to stand, using his sword to support his weight. Grimacing, he reached up, brushing sweaty bangs away from his eyes, before making his way over to a water barrel that belonged to the carpenters. He ladled some water into his mouth before pouring some over his head. The chill water helped sober him, driving the lingering effects of the dream from his consciousness. He took another deep gulp of water before stepping away, placing a hand to his forehead. It had been so real. He felt the heat of the fire. He felt the terrible blast from the Guardian strike him. Had it really happened? He hoped it truly was just a dream and not a memory of the past. Slowly he stepped forward, all thoughts of returning to his bed forgotten. He would not be sleeping any more this night, and it was still night, he saw. The moon had moved inexorably closer to the horizon, but the sky had not yet begun to brighten with the coming of dawn. The night was cool, but it felt good for the moment, on his bare chest. He stepped around a small outcropping of rock, sitting down on it and looking up at the sky overhead. Millions of stars dotted the night sky, as far as the eye could see. Seeing them now, he realized that he could pick out a few constellations that looked familiar to him, yet he didn't know their names or significance. With a quiet voice, not wanting to wake any of the sleeping men, 
he said. Can you hear me, princess? He got no response, though, outside of a distant bird's call. She was probably trapped in the castle, unable to see or hear, imprisoned by Ganon. Princess? Nothing. He could remember the panic he'd felt in the dream. He needed to see her. Needed to know she was safe. Was she safe now? Princess Zelda. Still nothing. He wished he could forget her scream. That awful sound pierced his very soul. Zelda. A whisper on the wind, quieter than a breeze through tall grass. If there had been any other sounds, he wouldn't have even heard it. But he did. Link. For a time he sat in silence, breath caught in his throat. Had he really? It seemed too good to be true, wishful thinking. And then he heard it again, her voice. Link. You can hear me? You can speak to me? He spoke in a slightly louder tone now, hoping to get a reply, but dreading that he might not. I can, but... There was a pause, and when she spoke again, the voice stronger than before. My time is limited. My strength is not what it once was. And I fear that should Ganon discover that you live, it already rages about the destruction of its creature in Ruta. Are you all right? The words seemed foolish the moment they left Link's lips. How could he ask her if she was all right, after all she had endured for the last 100 years? Considering what she endured, even now. For the time being, I am still able to hold him at bay. I hold the power of a goddess, after all. He thought that he could detect a note of bitterness in her tone, but it was difficult to tell. After a moment, she spoke again. What of you, Link? I have witnessed so much of your journey. I have seen that you have begun to regain some memories. Do you remember much? Too little, he whispered, looking down. Fragments, events. I saw you at the Spring of Power. Yes, I remember. I had wondered if that's why you went there. Princess Zelda paused for a time before speaking again. That was a difficult night, but it wasn't terrible. He thought of the laughter they'd shared over their supper, their banter, and the warmth of her body next to his. No, it had not been all bad. Though those things seemed small in light of the rushing disappointment that followed, he'd accomplished little to change the evening's trials. What else do you remember? Link exhaled slowly, shaking his head. Bits and pieces? Some of my time in Zora's domain with Mipha, flashes of other things? Places I've been, people I may have known. Link fixed his eyes on a distant point on the horizon, trying to imagine for a moment that he could see the princess standing before him. It's all jumbled, without any context to tell me when they happened or where they took place. My own memories are like that some days, she said. She could have been right beside him, for how close her voice sounded now. Sometimes I can remember things with such clarity that I almost feel like... myself. Other days, I barely have any concept of who I am. On those days, there is only the struggle against Ganon. I am so sorry, Princess, Link said, dread filling his heart. I wish I could remember more, to know where I could have done more to stop all this from happening. Don't be ridiculous. Did you detect mirth in her tone? It is largely because of you that this world still lives. She must have been able to see Link's confused expression, because she continued before he could reply, speaking more quickly now. I am afraid that I do not have much time to explain at this moment. I am not entirely certain that I even could. I can feel Ganon pressing against my barrier once again. But Link, know that seeing you alive, hearing that you are recovering your memories, and witnessing your victories against Ganon's creatures, these things give me hope. They give me strength. I may not always be available to speak to you like this, and I am sorry. 
I know that you are still confused, but please be strong. Have faith that all will be revealed in time. I will, Link said, frowning into the night air. I'll find a way to get you out of there. I know you will. He felt a shift in the air that seemed to signify that Princess Zelda's presence had left him. She had gone, seemingly retreating back to the castle in order to prevent Ganon from using her distraction in order to break free of her prison. With a grimace, Link leaned back on his hands, looking back up to the stars. He remained there until dawn, watching silently as the sky gradually lightened and the stars faded from view.